we were discussing the the decision problems with respect to options okay we we have okay when we were discussing the decision problems with respect to options one important point which i did not mention which he uh, highlighted at the end of the class is so we discussed that when we are talking about buy or sell which is a general uh, under the general class of decision problems when we are talking about buy or sell uh, we have uh, additional decision problems with respect to options okay which is you have to decide uh, what is the expiry what is the strike price okay whether it's a call or put and you also have to decide what is what we call the exercise style remember what are the different types of exercise style american european and bermudan right so easy way to remember because bermuda is in between europe and uh, america right north america so that's why bermudan so essentially bermudan has the character i mean it is halfway kind of between because you can exercise at uh, specific points of time but not at any point of time okay so therefore this is also something that has to be decided what kind of options you want to trade but one of the reasons i did not list it actually I, but theoretically i agree that it should be listed but one of the reasons uh, it effectively does not become a decision problem is because the market situation solves it for you like for instance if you go back to uh, where we had uh, if we go back to our framework okay where we have this okay so essentially what happens like these options that you are trading now you are being asked to trade us equity options now by convention usually there is a market convention okay us equity options typically happen to be uh, by convention they are american style okay except only one type of index option that they have we are not trading index options we are where the underlying is an index we are trading individual stock options right stock options on microsoft oracle procter and gamble etc we are trading in the index we are not trading index options we are trading individual stock options so when you are talking about options here this is too big a zoom actually yeah so when you're talking about here when you're looking in this matrix when you're looking at this when you're looking at sorry when you're looking at this options on equities these in the, in the us these tend to be american style options options on individual equities are american style option so basically by when i define the market that you're going to trade in and the market instrument combination when i define i say that you're going to trade us equity options you're pretty much boxed in now you can't ask for european style uh, us equity options because by convention the market trades with american style options okay so this is what so similarly when you go if you are trading fx options which is also a very big market okay as you know fx is the biggest market actually of all the asset classes the biggest set of markets in terms of volume so when you are trading fx options otc fx options these are by convention uh, european style okay so once again when you are trading otc us uh, uh, fx options okay you will not have the luxury of you can always because it's otc there will be some customization we haven't come to the distinction between otc and exchange traded markets but uh, essentially again the market convention confines you to a particular style of exercise now if you go to the fx option market and ask for an american style option quote there will be a slight difference in the price so you won't get the most liquid segment of the market the way you get the most liquid price the best prices is by conforming to the market convention right so if somewhere there if the market in gazipur they are trading sugar in in quintals now you go and say i want a quote in some odd kind of measure like gram or something like that then you will not get the best market price because they have to customize a price for you okay because the other guy that guy can't lay off his risk on the market so these are the market conventions so but it's an important point that she brought up that in theory when we are studying in theory when we are studying the um the decision uh, the incremental decision problems that arise in the case of options uh, you will uh, we we should mention the point about the exercise style okay so we'll go on to our next point now so i hope everybody is clear about the money ness part okay in the money at the money what part of the money you can read the details in this particular link as well this is a good good website okay so uh, tws task we already covered that part now we continue with what is our next uh, so we have okay so we will now look at option sensitivities let me just uh, so what i've tried to do is to make it easier for you guys 
I am actually uh, just highlighting the to topics that we are studying. I am putting them in the middle of the in the middle of the page. Okay, so if it is some kind some kind of just a reminder for me, like TWS starts, I am not putting it in the middle of the page. But if we have covered this topic, fair value versus price, uh, value versus price, subjective versus, it's listed as a topic. So when you are revising, you make sure that you cover all these topics, that you have understood all these topics. We will obviously spend much more time on models later on. Right now, again, I am under pressure because I have to quickly give you the uh, decision framework for option trading because your project will start. So what we'll do with the project, we'll try to go for um, your, uh, we are now in September. If we start trading in, uh, I think your, your, um, your last day of class is 7th November, so we'll make the project end on 8th November. Bulletin received. Okay, so uh, we'll add, make the project end on 8th November. So if you want five, uh, if you want five weeks of trading, okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so which means we should really start trading from not 4th of October from this two, three, four, five. We should start trading from 7th October. Is that right? If we start 7, 2, 3, 4, 5. Is that correct? Sir, I think we have to start from 4th of October. 4th October is a Friday. We don't start trading on a Friday. We typically, would, I understand what you're saying, but you're right. Mathematically, you're right. Because you're, if you want to end on the 7th, but we'll make it end on the 8th. Because we want to end on a Friday and start on a Monday. Okay, is that right? But you're right. Okay, so uh, so is, so is that is that okay? So you guys had better quickly get accustomed to what you're doing. Okay, make sure you have form because we'll see very quickly what you have to what kind you have to form views on two things. Earlier in the NSC project, you were forming views only on the underlying. Okay, this time you'll have to form views on the eyeball as well, which I'll show you how to get to the eyeball charts. But essentially, but at least start out by forming views on the underlying. You should uh, look up the charts and start getting comfortable with the stocks that you've been assigned. Okay, what is happening to them? Uh, where where do you think it's going? So the underlying view will be an important part, and we'll have to additionally look at the eyeball view. So I'll give you that. But pre better start preparing right now because we don't have much time. Okay, we want to have at least five weeks of trading. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this here. So our next point is actually uh, this. Let me set this. Right. So we're talking about option sensitivities. Okay. How do I stop these sponsored searches? I guess you can't. Okay. So we are next point is uh, option sensitivities. Okay. So we have this. We look at this. Now notice that we have all these uh, different uh, values given here: delta, vega, theta, rho, etc. Okay. So first look at. I think we have to go through some other stuff before we. Um, before we, we, we need to cover a little bit more on models. Okay, so let's cover, let's add one more, a uh, little bit more on models. Okay, so I'll just cover briefly a little bit of the theory of models. Okay. Okay, so if we are talking about models, we have, we should have some kind of basic theoretical break, uh, uh, understanding a taxonomy of models. So you want to talk about, uh, uh, anybody has any idea how would you define, how would you classify models? Any idea on a taxonomy of models or anything like that? Yes, anything? No? Okay, so one way to classify models is we can do like a, we can open your we can open your uh, instead of having this let's open the, your calc file and try to do a little bit here so this is also an example of a model actually this is a model of this is a spreadsheet where we are actually uh, modeling the forward price the fx forward price as a function of the spot price and the two interest rates okay this is an example of afv we studied what is afv we have not studied the concept but at least what 
evaluation. Arbitrage fee valuation. At least AFP that much you should know. Okay, we don't know what arbitrage is, but it's arbitrage. AFP models are arbitrage fee valuation models. So this is an example of a pure, uh, you know, a properly named AFP uh, model, where basically you are modeling the forward FX rate as a function of the spot FX rate and the two interest rates. Okay, so we'll come to this hopefully later, but let's try and uh, look at. Where else can we put in models? Okay, let's put it in here as well. Here itself in the DP4 paradigms, we'll put we just put it down a little bit more because here we have a chart of fair, we have a schema of fair value models and AFV models. Okay, so what we can what we can say is about models is we can say we have broadly we can have it as a uh, it's not going to be a pretty framework but I just want to keep it here so that you don't have to write it. On the one side you have mathematical and then you have so this is one way of understanding model because we want to learn it in a very general and so I'm just going to call it n mathematical which means non mathematical okay mathematical and non mathematical and here we can have uh, explanatory and we can have somewhere here we should have it we can write it proper or we can just write it here next column we'll just make it what is the opposite of oh, where well, we can write it here is predictive okay so this models thing should be here somewhere all right okay so you're getting the schema okay we are saying that so this should be like kind of like a does it work doesn't work very well we should do it this way doesn't work very well uh, what we want to do is actually wipe out uh, we want to wipe out this part and uh, it's not working very well but I think you understand what I'm trying to do yes I'm going to color code it okay I'm going to color code it and then we can have different different colors and then you'll understand what I'm trying to do here we will have no boxes so and here I'll just color code and are you able to see all the colors sometimes the colors don't render properly yes yes sir you're able to see the colors what everybody's highly amused why are you highly amused yes what happened okay now you get a schema of models okay because we want to study we want to have a comprehensive perspective of models when we are talking about models okay so you can have all this so one example of this would be let's say for instance here this can whole thing can be merged okay so here we can write like if you have sorry a non mathematical explanatory model okay would be um, let's let's say let's put it here okay so if you model let's say a steam engine steam engines uh, schema like say when J james watt first drew out the blueprint for a steam engine okay so if you have we'll call it the b print okay so if you have a blueprint kind of model like an engineering drawing right okay so this spreadsheet is already with you so this is you don't have to note this down because you can go to the spreadsheet chart at this sheet and go and look at this small spreadsheet is already already in your folder so what we're trying to say is that when you draw a schema for how a steam engine is going to work okay the pistons will be here the steam the water will be boiled in this case this is also a model actually in a way okay but it's a non mathematical model so if you model how a jet engine is supposed to work okay any kind of engineering drawing of a of some kind of uh, thing which is supposed to work is an example of a model because you're modeling how the thing is supposed to work okay so that would be an example of a non mathematical explanatory model because it is non mathematical because it's diagrammatic and it is actually just it is explaining it's not predicting anything it's explaining how the model uh, system works okay so that's an example of a non mathematical explanatory model a mathematical explanatory model could be some kind of uh, regression let's say uh, you can have some kind of regression which shows okay which maybe why is it explanatory not predictive you can also have regression predictive models but it's explanatory I'm saying if you take this example this I won't write here we'll just discuss it so one example is suppose you are trying to model the 
uh, some kind of a tax break which was given historically okay maybe that because very often you have these tax breaks which are there for 10 years okay or some five years or something like that so what was the investment that what was the incremental investment that we saw because of this tax break okay so it's a historical thing that tax break has already expired so you can uh, explain you can look at what the tax rate as a, the, the incremental benefit that was given in the tax rate and then you can look at the in incremental investment or employment that was generated okay and then you can say that this one unit of the tax break that we gave uh, that caused so much uh, you, you are familiar with regression models yes. you already done this y equal to bx yes. y equal to a plus bx a, a, a1 plus bx uh, sorry y is equal to a, uh, a plus b1 x1 you've done that format right so regression model here I think everybody is familiar with that but what I think you're not very familiar with is all the assumptions of a regression model and what happens when those assumptions break down have you done heteroscedasticity you don't know what heteroscedasticity is you don't know what autocorrelation is Okay, so you have done y is equal to so you have done basically a plus b1 x1 plus b2 b2 x2 plus dot 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 this you have done okay plus you have an error term okay but you don't know what autocorrelation is you don't know what heteroscedasticity is okay so the point you have to understand is that when you do these regression models okay there are certain assumptions like every model has a bunch of assumptions in it like i always like to refer to models as a bunch of assumptions nothing wrong with that okay but as long as you understand that it's a bunch of assumptions so you should also be alert to are my assumptions holding up or not okay so if i'm predicting heavy rain and that one of the assumptions is that within few hours uh, you know the sky will be 50 percent covered with clouds and then after six hours also there is no cloud in the sky that means there's something wrong with my assumptions it's not working so i should be so therefore that model is okay because i can observe that my assumptions are not working out okay so every model is going to be a bunch of most of the predictive models uh, especially in the social sciences including finance and economics all of them will have bunch of assumptions but you have to be alert to can you figure out when your assumptions are breaking down or not do you even how, how long does it take to find out if your assumptions are not working out okay so basically here in when you do these regression models these things like autocorrelation we assume that there is no autocorrelation autocorrelation means that uh, i'm not teaching you statistics so but essentially it means that the explanatory variables are correlated there is high correlation between x1 and x2 this is one of the assumptions okay this is one of the assumptions of the model is that there is no such thing there is no autocorrelation we assume that there is no autocorrelation okay we assume there is no heteroscedasticity okay these terms you should maybe do some research on them okay i'll just write it here you can do some research on them i'm not spelling it correctly i don't really need to worry about that heteroscedasticity this also I'm not spelling. Right. Just Google it, you'll see. Okay. These things heteroscedasticity means that the variance heteroscedasticity means that the variance of the error term is not constant. Okay. So the point is when you do these regression models, the regression equation, the simple linear regression model assumes that these problems do not exist in the data set okay that there is no they assume that there is no autocorrelation they assume that there is no heteroscedasticity okay so uh, therefore when these assumptions break down you have these kinds of problems so autocorrelation is an example of a assumption breaking down because the explanatory variables are correlated heteroscedasticity means variance of the error term is not constant so one of the assumptions of the model has broken down okay so when you use regression models 
you should also be aware of these issues and how to deal with these issues and all these things, right? So you should not just blindly use like some of your seniors come and say, I made a forecast as if, you know, he's like called the climb Mount Everest or something. You know, I made a forecast. Your forecast is basically just a pie in the sky number. I could just take a number from the rickshawala, you know, and compare it to your forecast. What is the value of the forecast? You have to, it's a very flimsy thing, especially in economics and finance. These forecasts have very little value. Okay, you can see the IMF changes its GDP growth forecast for the world and for major countries about five or six times a year. Okay, so what is the value of these forecasts? So you have to be very, very conscious about the assumptions underlying a model and what happens when these presumptions break. So you should on your own do some research on these kinds of uh, issues, okay, these concepts. Okay, so what we are talking about is a simple regression model, okay. You can have it as an explanatory model also. You can have it as a predictive model also. But so, so at least understand these two, we are talking about explanatory model. It can either be a mathematical model like a regression where you show that because of this tax break, we had this extra employment over this period. But it's just an explanatory model because you're not trying to predict anything because that tax break has already gone. Okay, you are just trying to analyze the impact of that policy. Okay. Now, when you talk about mathematical predictive models, so if you're looking at what is this box, non-mathematical predictive model, basically here there is nothing, no such thing almost, okay, because it is very uh, dodgy to think of a, a non-mathematical predictive model. You can actually have it. So I'm leaving it as a question mark, but it's it's kind of not really used because it's kind you know it's 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 a way of you just say that okay you know if there is heavy snowfall in Simla then maybe there will be some rain in Delhi tomorrow. It's you're not very being very specific. You're making some kind of so it's not really very useful these kind of statements. But we can think of it. We'll just leave it as a box. We are not very concerned with that. Now in economics and finance we are mainly concerned with this box. Okay to some extent with this box also but we are mainly concerned in this box okay so this is where we go so most of the models that you guys do okay these are in the nature of predictive mathematical models okay so essentially this is what uh, the idea the, here is okay so in the case of a predictive mathematical model okay if we talk about we can just leave this here as let me copy this big work from here okay so how should we define a predictive mathematical model yes anybody how should we define a predictive mathematical model Anybody, any idea? You guys are doing courses and all some of you are doing courses. Have you uh, defined a predictive mathematical model? Should be a specific definition, right? Like if I'm taking a class on baking cakes, the first question I'll ask is what is a cake? What am I making, right? I should have a definition of a cake, some kind of clear cut definition. So one of the ways, so you should look at these, uh, so you should ask these fundamental questions. What is a model, right? So. Yes, okay. Yeah, really? What? Okay. Independent and dependent variables. Okay. Then? Yes. Yeah, so predictive is uh, covering, we are already talking about predictive mathematical models. Okay, we can actually, uh, we can actually leave this out because we can, we can define mathematical model as a, um, as a, gen, as a general principle, we can use it for explanatory models also. Okay, but uh, I'm mainly interested in the predictive model definition, so I'll keep that within brackets. Okay, so yes, okay, you're right, there's an independent and dependent variable. Anything else? Uh, some of the factors will stay constant. Which factors will stay constant? Independent or dependent? Sir, that we are assuming. Sir, so are there other factors other than these? Other factors, what are the other factors that should stay constant? Yes. Uh, I'm not agreeing necessarily, I'm saying just she's saying. Yeah. In this one, we have a uh, constant that actually variables, uh, that actually modulates the result of our, from the forecasted group, uh, named as beta. 
to take a beta value that is actually related to the what is the force in the market. Okay. Through that we predict that. Okay. So you're you're talking about are you talking about coefficients? You were talking. He's talking about coefficients. Yeah. The beta is a regression coefficient. Yes, sir. What is beta in terms of if you want to understand it connected to your understanding of regression? Is beta? You remember? Have you done the derivation of beta? No, sir. Yet to. You have not done the derivation of beta. Just two classes. No, but what did you do in FM one? You did not do a regression. Excess returns on the stock versus excess returns on the index. You didn't do when you covered beta because you have already covered it in FM one, right? Okay, never mind. Okay, let's not go into all that. Let's forget about whatever it is now. Okay, so fine. There are regression coefficients. Okay, so you can talk about regression coefficient. Uh, so essentially, not necessary regression because regression is a particular type of model. We want to give a more general definition. Okay, so there are independent and dependent variables. Okay, plus uh, you can say. Um, so then we will say, let's say, is this. Uh, spelling we'll just call it coefficients okay because essentially what you're talking about is we have to define it in general terms these are essentially coefficients okay okay so which are basically assumed to be we'll bring in uh, Tanya's element here uh, assumed to be constant okay actually these are what is the thing about estimate uh, how, how did you come up with a beta as a coefficient you understand that now yes sir. Uh, maybe you have not understood it earlier but beta in statistical term it's a it's a regression coefficient yes sir yes. okay it's a regression coefficient right so basically that's just what it is what is beta beta is basically one of these things yes, beta is one of these things okay so in that model you have only the in the beta model in the cost of equity model if we now rehash and look at the cost of equity model if y is the cost of equity what is the a in the cost of equity model risk free rate right so a is the risk free rate okay and what is the x1 yes risk equity risk premium what we call the equity risk premium the uh, x1 in the beat in the cost of equity model is the rm minus rf yes. which we call the equity risk premium right is this clear yes. and the beta b1 is the beta this is clear in the cost of equity model right so now you remember it now you are able to connect it to earlier you did not think that it was a regression coefficient but now you understand that uh, beta is a regression coefficient this is clear okay so you can say yes there is an independent and dependent in a, in a predictive mathematical model okay there will be independent and de dependent variables some of these elements of the definition we can also apply in general to explanatory mathematical models but since in finance and economics we are mainly concerned with predictive models I am going to slant the definition towards predictive models okay okay so uh, and so what is the point the point is that beta is a regression coefficient okay and how did you arrive at the beta if I say that Oracle has a beta of 1.2 from the past data so the point is that it is estimated from past data right okay so usually it is estimated okay so uh, and coefficient assumed to be constant and usually estimated okay so now what we say is that what we would like to say is that basically the model okay uh, predictive mathematical model let's say has okay um, or let's say we can say consists of okay um, and we should say the model so here's the important point that the model specifies okay a precise relationship okay and so when it specifies the precise relationship you should also understand that precise means also also because it's mathematical it's rigid so I'm not making some general statement that oh if there's some snowfall in Shimla then there'll be some maybe there'll be some rainfall in Delhi but it is actually quite rigid now what is happening here the, the display is a little bit odd precise what I want to also say and therefore pre precise means something is wrong with the display here I'm getting 
Should I refresh this page? Why is it? Yeah, okay, fine. So, precise relationship between the Okay, so part of the precision and the rigidity comes from the fact that the coefficients which you as which you have put into the model. Okay, you can look at a model example here itself. Okay, p two x two. Now uh, this itself, this because the coefficient, these are all constants. Okay, so we should write this as a something is wrong. Let me just try and refresh. You think it'll work out okay if I refresh it? Okay, are you guys following now? Yes. So we want to have a precise definition of a model. So it has independent and dependent variables and some coefficients which are usually estimated. And the point is of a mathematical predictive model is that it specifies a precise relationship between the independent and dependent variables okay so that is what is important because and precision also you should understand precision means it's rigid once you say that uh, you know that uh, six inches of snowfall in Shimla equates to uh, you know maybe 100 centimeters of rain in Delhi the next day then you can't if the rainfall actually is not 100 centimeters or 50 centimeters you can't go and change okay maybe my mom because once you specify the model it's rigid so if it is not 100 centimeters of rain, that means your model was wrong. Your forecast was wrong. Then you can't escape it, right? It's a rigid relationship because you put it in mathematical terms. It becomes precise and it's very rigid, okay? So let's uh, see if this is a little bit better. Okay, are you following so far? Yes, sir. Okay, so it's very important to have a good theoretical understanding because uh, this is what I feel that when you're studying a subject, you should have a good theoretical understanding of the basics. Once your basics are clear, the job of an MBA program, according to me, is really to make sure that your theoretical fundamental, uh, theoretical foundations are very strong. Once your theoretical foundations are strong, then later on you can learn things on your own. Okay, but your found fundamentals have to be strong. Okay, all right. So we want to have a basically the model specify the precise uh, and rigid relationship between the independent and dependent variables. Okay, okay. So this is one way of thinking about a mathematical predictive mathematical models. Okay, now let's think of some other names for independent and dependent variables. Okay, so that we have the terminology of models quite clear. Other names. What are the other names? If I say um, um, explanatory variable and forecast variable, okay, between independent and uh, and uh, so if I say explanatory versus forecast. forecast variable okay so I'm going to use two other terms explanatory variables and forecast variables now explanatory is like independent or like dependent yes Saloni explanatory variable is it like independent or dependent dependent what independent you think it's independent okay fine so anybody else yes Gulati so explanatory variable versus forecast variable this is like when we study try time series data versus uh, cross-sectional data and we try to connect it to stock concepts versus flow concepts okay we're doing the same kind of exercise here are you following yes okay so similarly now I'm saying I can use two other terms which is independent variable and dependent variable is one set of terms I can also say explanatory variable versus forecast variable so my question to Gulati is explanatory variable is it like independent or dependent dependent, dependent. okay so you are disagreeing with Saloni yes Chuk? explanatory is independent okay so you are on Saloni's side yes anybody else independent. everybody thinks independent so you're all alone okay <laughs> now you also agree okay <laughs> all right so explanatory is like so now I think we have a chance to use my new theory whether my geo is going to work with the uh, without having to drive because the Wi-Fi signal is a problem right 
Uh, explanatory new explanatory model. Yeah. Wi-Fi is very strange. I've discovered like there was the other day when I, we were having a meeting in the conference room. I had my geo device. It was picking. It was being picked up by the my tablet, but my computer was not able to pick up the geo device. And later on, when I went into my room, so that was in conference room A, ground floor. Then I went to my office, and I then it works in the same physical layout. Both are able to pick up the Wi-Fi signal. Yes. Sir, uh, you classified the models. Sir, the uh, you classified models. All the general models are classified on these basis or the only specific one minute. Option one sec. Let me just switch this. On. Yeah, I'm just trying to switch on this thing. There's a problem with the test. Yeah, what was what was your question? Sir, I was asking let's go back to the classification. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's go back. Sir, the, uh, this classification is for general or this classification is only for the option models? I just want to know. No, 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 no. This is a general classification. That's why I've included even things like a schema of a jet engine. If you are designing a new type of jet engine, like Pratt and Whitney has been working on, you know, Pratt and Whitney, right? This is a major famous maker of jet engines. Most of the aircraft, they have Pratt and Whitney jet engines. So Pratt and Whitney has been working for 15 years on a new model of the jet engine, which will be much faster and much stronger, much lighter. Okay. So this will obviously have a different schema when you look at the blue, the engineering blueprint. That's also a model of how the engine is going to work. Okay. So maybe you're relocating some parts of the engine here and there. You're changing the design. So it's a general definition because it includes all kinds of models because those are also models. So you should know, just like I said, when you are treating some, if you are, uh, you know, just treating somebody to idli, dosa, and uttapam, you shouldn't call it Indian food. You should call it South Indian food, so that they don't have the wrong idea that that's all there is to Indian food. Okay. So that's why this is a general framework which covers all kinds of models. Okay. So if you remember in your biology or whatever the whatever class you covered it, that model of the ecosystem where the snake is eating the rat and all that. That's also a schema, right? That's also the food chain model. Remember? Yes. That that's also a model. Actually, it's a model of the food chain, but it's a it's a no, what kind of model is that? Non-mathematical explanatory model. That's a non-mathematical explanatory model. That's also a model. It is giving you some information, valuable information, right? So, okay. So to come back, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, it's a general framework. So you know that where you are in the mathematical predictive models. And within that, further I've given you another schema that there are forecast-based models and there are what we call AFP models. Okay. So what you do mostly when you are doing modeling, okay, is you are doing only this, but there's also something called AFP models. Okay. And then again, in with that also there are two types. Improperly called AFP or properly called AFP. What I showed you here, the first sheet, this is a proper AFP model. The model of the forward rate as a function of the Remember this lingo also. Here I'm modeling the forward FX rate as a function of the spot FX rate and the interest differentials, the two interest rates. This is a proper AFP model. Okay, we'll come to, we'll hopefully have a chance to cover all this uh, in our syllabus. But this is where this goes. That's why it says FX forwards, cross rates. We'll start first with the cross rate example. Okay, but the option pricing models, which you have already seen before, this model. This is actually classified under AFP because they use AFP principles to price to, to construct the model. Okay, but it's actually not AFP because you can't actually perform the arbitrage. Okay, you can't force the fair value. You can't force the price to move to the fair value. Remember this, both these models are operating in what kind of world? This model will give you a fair value of the Australian dollar at maybe 69. You will see that the price is 68. Don't forget this framework that both these types of models. Am I moving too fast? Yes. No, sir. Yes. Are you following? Yes, sir. Both these what? Some are saying yes, some are saying no. Yes. yes. So both these models, don't forget, they operate in this larger framework. That why are you doing a fair value estimate? This is a price versus value based comparison paradigm, okay, framework where you are going both these models are covered under this what are you doing basically why are you computing fair value because at the end after computing fair value you look at the price and your model maybe says the fair value of the australian dollars is 69 cents but you see that the price is here so therefore you will buy 
because your view is that eventually the price must move to the fair value okay that is the basic framework so don't forget the larger framework that there are other steps after you compute the fair value okay so this is basically what the the idea is so so these all these models so coming further dilating on the response to your question okay that these are this is the overall schema of models and within predictive models i've given you a further within mathematical predictive models i've given you a further schema which is you have these fair value these uh, forecast based valuation models and then you have the afv both of which are in the value versus price comparison based models okay uh, uh, in the in this framework okay and the other point of understanding the larger framework which i forgot to mention briefly the other day is that this the fact that all of this discussion is coming into play in the context of the buy sell problem that also you should not forget okay that whole discussion of valuation models and everything why is it coming up because further down the road you need to solve the buy sell problem that's why you're doing this are you following yeah. that also you should not lose sight of and the reason of this uh, you should uh, the, the reason the, the other importance of this framework is that usually you do the most of the time finance courses spend time on this valuation el elements of this okay and usually on stock valuation but you should also remember that because this this whole discussion arises in the context of the buy sell problem right therefore when you remember when you remember that there's something called ta you should also remember that actually to so there is one way to solve the buy sell problem without any reference to value are you getting what i'm saying because in most finance textbooks and finance courses there's a lot of time spent on valuation so the only thing i'm asking you to be mindful of is that why are you spending time on value not because it's an end in itself but, but because it is meant to help you to solve the buy sell problem should i buy this asset or should i sell this asset is this first point clear yes sir that why are you spending time on this valuation exercise because you want to uh, further down the road solve this problem of should i buy or should i sell okay but if you are aware of ta if you know this framework that basically this the problem of buy sell can be solved in two ways either using ta which is totally value agnostic okay or you use this value versus price comparison which is what you do when you do this valuation exercise <laughs> but you should also remember that if your underlying problem is to solve the buy sell decision problem okay that can be done without that it is not necessary to do this what i'm trying to say is that it is not necessary to do this valuation exercise in a theoretical sense absolutely because you can solve the buy sell decision problem even using ta if you want to are you following what i'm saying at least theoretically that is there that option that should be clear in your head okay so even for someone like chuk who is clearly leaning towards fundamental analysis from what we have seen about his views i'm not uh, blaming you or anything it is just a description we know from your inputs in the class that you are not likely to become a pure technical trader but the point i'm trying to emphasize is that to be even if you are a purely technical trader there's nothing wrong with that it is a completely legitimate approach and if you can bring rigid risk management to the table it's a highly uh, is a very solid uh, robust approach okay so the point is you should you should be aware that you should not get lost in this valuation thing you know i'm not getting the valuation right the valuation problem exists only in the context of the buy sell decision problem and the buy sell decision problem can also be solved without any reference to value whatsoever is this clear yes. for those who are using ta that you can have a perfectly happy life as a trader without any reference to valuation if you are practicing ta and you are doing it properly with proper risk management is this point clear i just wanted to emphasize this that you should understand this while you are doing valuation but when you go into industry as so why don't i just train you as ta pretty much what we did in the first uh, course because i had to get you ready for the uh, i had to get you ready for the first project okay i had to give you something quicker the advantage of ta is one style of ta can be taught very quickly okay so i had to teach you something very quickly so i taught you that ta part but why don't i just leave it at that and leave you and just go more and more into ta because industry expects when an mba student comes out they expect that the industry student will be familiar with valuation techniques okay so we have to prepare you in a general way with a broad based skill set later on in life you can decide to become a pure technical trader if you want to 
okay so when we do further discussions on fa versus ta what are the real differences then you get more insight on what kind of approach you want to follow but as a, a mba graduate you have to be familiar with uh, afv you have to be familiar with valuation okay so all these techniques that's why everything will be covered okay and a little bit will be spent which have, we have already spent on ta we won't be able to spend more time because now we have to focus on these because industry tends to focus more on these things industry tends not to focus much on ta okay or at least even if they do they pretend that they don't use ta much okay it's kind of like voting for donald trump right one of the reasons why because the media gave him such a bad name that even those who are going to vote for him in the polls they said no i'm not going to vote for him but secretly they went and voted for him so in ta also what happens is that a lot of people use it okay because fa is not precise enough but they don't like to say because can you you can imagine right ta what are you doing you're just looking at a chart and you're just following okay i'm just taking a call that okay either this is going to go further down or further up it looks kind of silly right it looks like it's like you're doing astrology or some voodoo or something like that so people like to show that they are very logical we have done some solid analysis and all that so that's why people don't like to say that we are using the even though actually people use it but even those who use it try to pretend that they're not using it but this is the politics of the aspect so the bottom line is that as mba students you have to be uh, broadly skilled when you are learning you have to cover everything and then you later on decide to specialize okay so a long discussion on models and all that but hopefully at least i would like to think that all the discussions are relevant okay so we have got one thing cleared up that explanatory should go under independent clear and forecast should go under dependent okay so this part is in your notes itself so you will have this all right are you following so far what we are doing we'll put this on top so that we have okay independent stroke explanatory and dependent stroke um what happened what is this why is this noise coming okay yes okay all right okay guys next one more term endogenous exogenous have you heard these terms yes. you heard it now aurora will help us endogenous where does endogenous go one minute let me first spell it properly okay um endogenous where does endogenous go does it go to uh, independent or dependent in which group does it go independent non minute let arora answer endogenous independent endogenous goes into independent independent okay anybody else who has sg1 endogenous is my question clear yes sir so we have these groupings we are saying we have one one independent versus dependent then we have another set of terms depend uh, explanatory versus forecast and we are saying that explanatory goes with independent and the forecast goes with dependent so now i have given you another set of terms endogenous and exogenous and arora says that endogenous goes into uh, independent endogenous goes with independent so you have you agree with them or you disagree <laughs> not clear <laughs> who else puri is my question clear so endogenous goes with independent or dependent <coughs> yes independent endogenous you are agreeing with arora yes okay who else can we ask shivam yes <laughs> you agree with barola okay so you also feel independent anybody disagrees with them kanika you disagree okay so you feel that endogenous goes is into dependent okay fine anybody agrees with kanika no yes tanya you are murmuring something okay endo endo reminds me of kendo there's a uh, sword fighting technique no kendo have you seen that there's, there's actually it's like fencing it's a japanese sword fighting technique kendo so yes anybody if you do kendo you develop a kendo attitude you know that right? okay 
So anybody else wants to pipe, uh, tell us something, Parun? Any input? So you are on Aurora's side. Okay. So Kanika is all alone. Anybody else wants to help join Kanika? Is the question clear? Yes, sir. The question is clear to everybody? Yes, sir. Okay. So opposite of endogenous is? Exogenous. Okay. Okay. So, so let's, okay, let's get this understood clearly. We'll write, don't write it like this. Okay. So don't write it like this. I'm just writing it like this just to make it clear to you. Okay. But please don't write endogenous. Don't say, to, don't tell people our teacher told us to write endogenous like this. Okay. So let me just help you first. Exogenous. Exo has the sense of outside or inside? Outside. Exo has the sense of outside. Okay. How does a model work? What did we say? The model specifies a precise rigid relationship between independent and dependent variables. Go back to our model over here. Okay. We can put in some others. Make it look more complicated, which is always supposed to be better. Most human beings like complicated stuff. If it's more complicated, it's better. Okay. But which is obviously not true. So you should be aware of that. I don't know why this display is very confusing for me visually. The, somehow the cursor is not properly positioned. What is the problem actually? It is at 100%. Okay, so anyway, all right, okay, guys. So now we were talking about XO. XO, we are saying, sounds more like outside. Okay, so we take this as an example of a model. In this model, if you think of a model as like a black box kind of thing, okay, you put some stuff like you think of it like a sausage machine. You put some stuff into the sausage machine and the sausage comes out, okay. So now if you think of this as some kind of a, a black box machine, right, you put something into the model and something comes out, right. So whatever you put into the model, you are putting into from outside, it's coming to the model from outside. So endo and exo is with from the model's perspective. You imagine that you are the model. So endo and exo is from the model's perspective. You should remember it like this. So you, as if you are the model and what is coming to me from outside and what is being generated. So endo then, if exo is outside, endo is inside. Is this clear? Yes. You agree? Yes, sir. Chuk is, <laughs> Chuk doesn't agree with this. Okay. So exo is outside and endo is inside. We can agree? Yes. yes? yes sir. Okay. What happened? Who is falling asleep? Garvit has fallen asleep. Okay. All right. Okay, guys. Now, in this model, what is coming from outside? What are the dependent variables and what are the independent variables in this model? Y is dependent. And what are the independent variables? X1, X2, X3. Right? And B1, B2, B3 are the coefficients. Okay. So, I should write this as my cursor is causing so many problems that uh, yeah i'm able to write it properly now okay all right so these are the coefficients these so are now we know so in this model let's understand what exogenous is okay so exo is outside so in this model if you think of yourself as this model what is coming from outside x1 x2 x3 is coming from outside and these are Independent or dependent? Independent. These are independent. So then exogenous is like? Independent. Independent. So Kanika was correct. Okay. So the others were wrong. So you can see that majority doesn't always win. Okay. So endogenous, exogenous is outside and endogenous is inside. Okay. So we say that exogenous, we put this here together. Okay. And we put the endogenous here. Uh, it's just as well that I made it small case because I don't think it'll fit in one line. Yeah, it doesn't fit in one line. So I'm going to make this whole thing. All right, good. Okay. Is this... Okay, is this clear now guys? So we've learned some new... We've just clarified a few terms. We didn't learn everything was not new. Independent, dependent, you already knew. But explanatory forecast and you've learned another pair of terms, endogenous and exogenous. So now you should never forget it. You should think of yourself as the model and what is coming from outside, all the stuff that is pumped in, which is the independent variables which are pumped into the model. And the model has been told that these are the coefficients 
So if the value of the endogen, whatever the value is pumped in from for the endogenous for the exogenous variable, the model will apply the coefficients and then it will calculate that expression. Okay, on the RHS of that model, that model is an equation, right? So you have this on the RHS, whatever the values are, the model will calculate it. Okay, and then it will throw out. So why is this endo? Why is the dependent variable endo? Because we said endo is the opposite of exo, so it is kind of inside. So the where is the endo coming from? Where is the Y coming from? Because it's coming from all the processing done inside the model, right? Because you have already written the model as A equal to Y plus A, uh, a plus B uh, or RHS is equal to uh, A plus B1, X1, etc. So you feed in all the X1s, you feed it from outside, the model calculates inside and throws out the value of the in, of the dependent variable, which is endogenous because the value is determined inside the model. Is this clear now? Yes. So now you should not forget these terms. We should be clear about these terms before we go. So basic model parlance should be known to everybody. Okay, these are basic lingo of models. Okay, endogenous, exogenous, etc. All right. So now let's look at. We were going to look at basically this. The point that we were going to look at is. We're really going to look at option sensitivities. We've already covered moneyness of options. We're going to look at option sensitivities. Okay. So the this should be with the okay. All right. Okay. So let's look at these sensitivities which you already have in the option model. Okay. Right, so some of these things we have to be just aware of, okay, what this is. I'll just make sure that I, uh, let me just see if we have sensitivities here. Uh, yeah, okay. So we'll just put this here so that you don't have to. And I've given you the, um, this is a better font. So some of this stuff I'm putting straight into your text so that you can read from here. We actually will put it here. So it goes straight into your uh, your topic and this. Okay. So we are going to look at some of this stuff. When you look at it, typically when you look at an option option pricing model, we are now studying the topic of option sensitivities. Even my geo is causing problems. The connectivity. Okay, uh, all right guys, so let's uh, look at these models. So all this stuff is written here, so you don't need to write down anything at this point, okay? Which we are just gonna look at the option sensitive option model here, okay? All right, just look at this option model. When you look at a typical option model, it also throws out, along with the option price, it throws out a bunch of uh, what we call in mathematical terms, you are familiar with partial derivatives. Most of you have not done calculus. Not everybody has done calculus. Some have done. So nowadays they don't teach calculus in class up to class 12. Oh, you have to opt for mathematics. Okay, 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 fine, okay, fine. So, which I think very few people do. <laughs> okay, I'm sure, okay, in India a lot of people take maths also. Okay, guys, okay, so these are partial derivatives. Okay, understand this first. So first understand that's why we went to why did we have this long discussion about endogenous variables just to make the uh, also there's one more set okay which we have to look at we, the the topics are not complete okay we have to have one more point why is it causing so many connectivity problems even with the wired connection Trading connection lost connection am I right that this is like a wired connection now if I've used my data cable to plug into the geo so it's still uh, uh, taking input on Okay, so the basic Wi-Fi interference which was there in this room, that can't be, uh, we are not getting over that. Okay. Trading connection re-established. I don't know why we have Wi-Fi interference. And they don't seem to be able to fix it also. I don't know what, like nobody seems to know what is causing the interference. They don't want to fix it. They don't want to fix it. No? Okay, we'll just live with it. We'll manage whatever most of the stuff is loaded. Okay, guys, so first understand the sensitivities are connected to the reason. The reason I went into this long discussion on option models, okay, on models as such, okay, the basic structure of models, okay, is 
look at all the uh, one more set I had to enter, which I'm not going to be write, able to write right now. Uh, let's write down. Um, yeah, in your yeah, we have to add one more thing, which is very obvious. Okay, but we should be clear about that. But we, so inputs and outputs. So we've already discussed three sets of terms: independent, explanatory, exogenous, and their opposites. We need to look at one more set of terms, inputs and outputs. Not this is very easy. Yeah. So what is the input? Yes. Anybody? SG1. What is the input? Now, you understand my question? Is my question clear? Question is also not clear. We went through three sets of terms. Independent versus dependent, explanatory versus forecast, endogenous versus exogenous. Okay? So, now I am in introducing another set of terms. Input versus output. Okay? So, now input will go into independent or dependent? One minute. I am asking him. One minute. Nobody else should speak. Input will go into independent? Okay. Clear? So, Kriti, you agree with him? Yes, input goes into independent. Okay. So, one more set of terms, okay, which we should normally, uh, to be consistent, we should write that also. Okay. Uh, that makes it even clearer in case, uh, you know, there is any confusion anywhere, if you get confused at some point of time. So, this we, will, we should write. Independent should be written as input and they should be written as output. So in practice, we may just use simple terms like input and output because these are small, uh, sh short words. Okay. All right. So now look at this. That this particular one sec, guys. Please be quiet. Okay. So uh, we look at this option uh, valuation model. We should really call it a valuation model. I've already told you, told you why this. But the industry, you have to be careful about. This is true for many, many terms that you're going to learn. Okay. Because many of the terms in industry that are used, many of the terms that are used are not theoretically correct. But it's being used so often that people have just got used to it. Okay. So you have to know both. You have to know what they, what term the industry uses like arbitrage. When we come to the definition of classical riskless arbitrage, you'll understand what CRA actually is. And people use the word arbitrage very loosely in, in, in the industry. Okay. So most of the time when they're using the word arbitrage, actually it's not really arbitrage. Okay. So you have to be aware of both sides, both things. You have to be aware that the industry uses the word arbitrage for this kind of activity. Okay. Like risk arbitrage. When people are playing on m &A transactions. Okay. Uh, when they essentially what they do is they buy the stocks of the the classical risk uh, risk arbitra arbitra the risk of uh, situation is you buy the you think that something is going to be taken over you think that idea is going to be taken over by Vodafone so you buy the stocks of idea okay and you sell the shares of Vodafone okay that's called that the industry refers to as risk arm okay risk arbitrage so which is actually not really arbitrage in the classical sense but you have to be aware that industry uses this term risk arbitrage for this activity but then secondarily at a high level theoretical understanding for your own uh, clarity you should also be aware that this is not theoretically correct and why is it not theoretically correct so you have to operate at both levels okay so the advantage of being an mba is that you should know the theory you should know what is theoretically correct but at the same time you have to adapt to the industry so you should know what the industry is using so industry will call this option pricing models but actually these are option valuation models because these are fair value models you don't need a model to price it because the market is pricing the option you can see this here okay with these 24 days to go you can see here this the market is already pricing these options these are the option prices okay so you don't need to price this stuff the market is already pricing it through the interaction of supply and demand okay so these are actually option better but we'll just in use interchangeably opm or ovm i'm just going to call it ovm so look at the ovm what are the outputs in the ovm since you're going to be do doing options what kind of options are you going to be buying and selling yes who is whispering call option you are whispering call options fx no no you're not in this project you're not doing fx options 
you could also do a project on FX options, but in this project you are doing options on equities, okay. So call options of course, call options and put options would exist even in the case of op uh, FX. So one basic decision problem you have when it comes to the buy sell part is whether you are buying call or put, okay. So the outputs from the OVM, now try to understand the OVM structure. Now you are studying a particular type of model, okay. And where does this model go in this framework? The model goes in, it is actually a mathematical predictive model, okay. And it goes in this this category. It's a value versus price based comparison paradigm model, and it's actually AFP. They use AFP techniques, but it's actually not AFP because the label of AFP is improper. Okay, so it's actually not AFP. So it's kind of confusing when you look at it. But later on, I don't think we'll have time to analyze option models in detail. But let's at least understand where this falls in the in the overall framework. It's a OVM. It's a fair value model. Okay. This is a fair value model. The OVM is a fair value model. All there are different types of OVM. There's a Black Scholes model. You should be familiar with these names. Black Scholes model, Garvin Cole Hegel model, which is used for uh, FX options. Okay, a Holy model is used for interest rate options. There are various models, and they are all the same. Fundament conceptually, they are all the same. That they are all OVMs, which means they are all fair value models. So you have to understand these are fair value models, which means they compute a fair value. You have to compare it then to the price. Okay. So if you look at the uh, this option, uh, this OVM, okay, it's a fair value model, and the outputs of the OVM, the primary outputs of the OVM are these two. Okay, that's actually this also is not this is actually derived mechanically through a relationship called pit put call parity. Okay, but you can forget about that for the moment. But it basically these are the really the option is it's a call option pricing model, and then you derive the put option through an arbitrage condition. Okay, which is a real arbitrage condition called put up put call parity. So essentially, think of it as this OVM's output. The output of the OVM is the call option price. Okay. Try to analyze now you're looking at a particular example of a fair value model, okay, which is the OVM option valuation model. All option valuation models will have the same structure, whatever model you're looking at. Okay. The methods will be different, the computational methods will be different, but the net overall structure of the model is the same when you lay it out in terms of input output. So now these are this is the output, okay. And what are the inputs? All these are inputs, okay. This is the input, this is the input, this is of course just a mechanical that the user specifies or the trader specifies, okay. This is taken from the market, okay, this the, the, the user specifies, this also is known to everybody, okay, so it's kind of like exercise price, the trader can just enter it. Interest rate is taken from the market, so interest rates and underlying prices, these are taken from the market. This information is known to everybody and basically it's specified by the user, uh, by the person who is asking for the price, okay, or the fair value. Dividend yield is also kind of estimated. You know the historical dividend yield, but here this is a forward looking model. Okay, it's the inputs are actually supposed to be forward. So, dividend yield is actually not talking about the historical dividend yield, it is talking about the uh, future, the expected dividend yield, which means basically for this in this 30 day period, how much dividend do you expect? Okay, it's really talking about a forward looking dividend deal. And when you're looking at this dividend deal as a general OVM structure, you should think of it as a return on the under uh, return on the underlying asset. You remember we discussed this? You remember because this is an equity valuation, this is an equity option pricing model, equity option valuation model. That's why it says dividend deal. Do you remember we had the discussion the other day? When I told you that I don't want to use the word dividend yes, because dividend means it only refers to equities. I want to use the general word return on the underlying asset. Yes. Okay, that we were discussing when we were talking about the fair value models. What is the general structure of your fair value models? Remember here when we went into this, when we were talking about the general structure of forecast the periodic returns. This particular structure when we were talking about fair value models, we also included the Gordon growth model. Okay, so I'm just writing Gordon here so you remember. Bond valuation, NPV is also covered here. Okay, so when I talked about the, uh, the fair value models in general, okay. I, uh, the reason I use the word return, I told you why I was using the word return because I did not want to use a general term which is a mistake which many of you have made. 
when I ask you a general question, you return, uh, you say something, your response is in terms of shares. Your response should be in terms of uh, units of the asset. It should not be because I didn't talk to you just about equities. Okay. So many of you, even when there was a specific question on currency units, buying how many units of dollar Swiss you want to buy, answer is the number of shares. Because you got so stuck in that uh, share uh, concept. You know, everybody thinks about markets, they only think about stock markets. But that's not the right way to approach it when you're learning. Okay. So, uh, so basically, this is the reason I said returns because returns captures everything dividends, it covers uh, coupon payments on a bond, it covers cash flows from project. Everything is covered under returns. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so where, so the, where would we go here? Okay. So the point is here, dividend yield. You have to think of it as a gen in general terms as this is only applicable to stock valuation. So in general terms, it would be the return on the asset. Okay. So what is the return on the asset likely to be for the period under consideration? We can make this a little bit longer. We can make this a longer term option. What will happen to the call price? Will it go up or go down? If I increase the days, right now the price is 3.01 or 3.02. Now I want, instead of 30 day option, I want to have a, nine, a six month option. So the, what will happen to the call option price? Increase or decrease? Yes, Rajan? Increase or decrease? Decrease. Down or up? Show me, I can't hear properly. Go down. You think it will decrease. Okay. So when you buy car insurance for one year and you buy the same car insurance for three years, which will have a higher premium? One minute. Let Rajan answer. If you buy car, let's say your one year car inf insurance is 20,000. The same car, the same in uh, insurance cover, if you buy for three years, it will be more than 20,000 or less than 20,000? More than 20,000? Okay. And what did I tell you that options are like insurance? I use the word, remember when we discussed the word premium? Why, why is the option price referred to as premium? Because options are exactly the same as insurance. I mean, insurance is also a type of options. The insurance company is selling you the option and you are buying the car, uh, the car insurance, right? Now that Parul has got a license, now everybody is scrambling to buy car insurance. Parul is coming from the other side. People are desperately buying car insurance even if they don't have, right? So, uh, so don't, I hope you don't get upset. I mean, if I tend to pull people's legs, so people should not get upset. So car insurance, if you're buying for three years, same car insurance is going to cost you more if you buy for three years. So insurance is just like uh, options. It's a type of option. The car insurance company is selling you the option and you are buying the option, right? So therefore now if I increase the tenor of the option from 30 days to 120 days, what will happen to the price? It will increase. Okay. So if the price has increased, why two? Why are two people going out at the same time? Oh, you're just getting up to let him go out. Okay. Okay. Is this clear? Okay, guys. So please note this. Okay. All these are inputs. All these are inputs into the option o OVM. Okay. All these are inputs, the days until expiration, everything else. Okay. So uh, you've also seen something else that if I change one of the inputs, the output is changing. You can, obviously that's logical, but we still want to be clear about it. That uh, and the only way the output will change is if you change one of the inputs or if you rewrite the model. If you change one of the coefficients or something like that, or instead of plus, you write divided by or something like that. You change the specification of the model. Okay. So now dividend yield volatility will come to this. Okay. Rounding is not really an input. This is just for this display parts. Graph increment also we don't need to worry about. Now here's the interesting part, which is the volatility, which is basically what will be volatility. You can think of you know how uh, you know how frequently this will sort of how how wi widely this will fluctuate. We'll talk about. A mathematical definition of volatility later but the point is to understand here is that essentially we are trying to figure out how uh, you know how uh, sharp how widely this thing is fluctuating okay that's why we say it's volatile okay so that's what we're trying to estimate how widely will this fluctuate so this also is a forward-looking estimate this is meant to be a forward looking, this is in percentage, okay, this is mentioned in percentage terms and this is basically a annualized percentage figure which we put in, okay. So over one year, this means basically that it will fluctuate at 25% 
around the mean value okay so this is what the h wall means this is the the, the forecast volatility for the period this is also a forward looking figure this applies to this period just like this dividend yield also applies to this period what do you expect to be the dividend yield for the period that you are considering what do you expect so it's a forward looking figure and this also is a forward looking figure what annualized volatility do you expect over the period just like if you think if you try to predict what will be the it's like trying to predict what will be the uh, interest rate prevailing for the next six months okay so therefore this is basically it's kind of like trying to predict that typically say let's say what will be the average daily interest rate for the next six month period so it's a forward looking figure now what we have here what we want to understand today one topic which you want to understand option sensitivity so one of the things you clearly saw is that if i change one of the inputs the output changes okay so similarly so, so basically we can change many of these inputs now let's change the underlying okay let's look at how many yeah, three minutes okay so we are going to be concerned with some few uh, uh, we are going to be concerned with few uh, now I have to finally cut marks for both uh, Surbi and uh, Garvit because they are uh, constantly uh, Garvit is uh, I don't know maybe telling her jokes or something and Surbi is laughing one minute one minute I'm not really concerned I don't want anybody distracting me by if I look at anybody everybody should be looking at me okay so I don't want to see anybody concerned laughing smiling here there dancing jumping okay where where is this thing starting today so here once again every day we have some names okay so uh, your names are <laughs> Okay. okay guys quickly let's try and figure out quickly what what the sensitivity is that now time is not up one minute time one second, one second. so the point is that uh, if you see this okay so we are concerned with these uh, five sensitivities okay so what these things measure you can just do the reading on your own later on we'll just but the point is we are concerned with these five sensitivities which are usually given out by the OVM okay and these relate what are these basically these are for some particular input okay these show you basically how much will the value of the output change if you for one unit change in the respective uh, independent variable okay so that's what we are trying to measure in sensitivities it's a partial derivative concept that basically these are showing you how much by how much will the output change if you tweak one of the inputs by you know one unit okay so delta is talking about change in the underlying so if you can see if we change the underlying from 100 to if i make this like 50 uh, 50 the price will change so the delta is trying to capture that 6.33 is the price right now and the price will change the price effectively goes to zero because the exercise price is far away and for this with this low volatility this will effectively have a zero price so 50 is not good enough we should have changed it to something like 90 okay then the option price will there will be some kind of option price okay it drops a little bit and comes to 2.11 so but delta is capturing the change okay now you can see all all of these are capturing some kind of change or the time is up i'll just briefly run through this okay so gamma is trying to capture this is already in your notes okay so you can study it you can also look at this uh, this particular website this is a very good website i might have given it to you earlier uh, you will not find wrong information on this website it covers a lot of topics you can read this you should also read your textbook to understand the sensitivities so some of this stuff you have to do on your own okay otherwise so these are all the sensitivity delta is the sensitivity changing the underlying okay theta is the time to expiration okay and theta goes only one way basically time to expiration once you buy the option it only keeps dropping it never increases okay because obviously after you bought a three month option time only goes in one direction okay so we'll stop it here but you guys have to read up on all this stuff including this material okay and uh, this we'll cover this a little bit in the next class okay anybody has any technical questions
Yes? You have a technical question? Or you want your minus marks to be... Uh, so next time we have to remember that Garbit and uh, Surabhi also can't sit together. Anybody have a technical question? Technical question? Your team? Yeah, that will not happen. He has taken care of it. You don't have to worry about it. Any technical questions? Anybody technical question? Yeah. One minute. Yeah. This is a technical question. Then I'll close the video.